Good evening, the world. Let's say a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this time together this evening. We thank you for the love that is in this room. We thank you that we are as you created us to be and not what we made of ourselves. And tonight we dedicate this hour into your care and into your keeping. You are in charge by our request. And so we step back. We allow that love and light within us to step forward to guide us and to lead us to our highest good and our greatest joy. And for this, we give you thanks and pray this in the name and in the nature of the living, loving Christ's presence. Amen. How's everyone doing tonight? All right. Say, I am perfect and whole as God created me. Let's say that together. I am perfect and whole as God created me. Let's say it like you mean it. I am perfect and whole as God created me. We've got a lot of new faces tonight, so let's stand up and greet our neighbors. So good evening. My name is Jason Weeks, and this is the Miracle Hour, brought to you by the Academy of Spiritual Awakening. You can check us out on the web at www.themiraclehour.com. Also, if you would like a copy of this service um, on video, you can always see myself or David after the service, and we will get your email address. So as you all know, we only have one goal tonight, and that is to spread the message of the golden rule, and that is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love each other as we want to be loved. And also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank one of our volunteers this evening. Her name is Ania Frescott. I'm not, I don't see her in the audience, but we can always recognize her regardless. So let's give a hand, uh, a round of a hand for her, although she's not here. And just so you know, she helps out with the food every week and she's always here to clean up afterwards so we really appreciate it um, we have many volunteering opportunities here at tassa um, if you're feeling guided to you can always see myself or david after the service and we can talk to you about the different opportunities we have we are looking for somebody to volunteer to bring a potluck dish if you ask me i'd like steak i'm just saying um, but there is that opportunity so if you do feel guided you can always see us after the service the miracle hour is not the only thing that we offer throughout the week there is also an in-depth study of a course in miracles that is facilitated by kevin rice that is at thursday nights at 7 p.m at unity on the bay and for those who don't know where unity on the bay is it is on biscayne and 21st street you just head east towards the bay I also facilitate a Reiki circle every first and third Wednesday of the month at Unity on the Bay, so come check me out. We have a great time. It's a great opportunity to realize your, your awesomeness. So hopefully I'll see you there. And so now I'd like to invite up David Garza so that he can do a reading. David. Today's reading is from Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. The Bible declares all things were made by him, the divine word, and without him was, nothing, was not anything made that was made. This is the eternal verity of divine science. 
If sin, sickness, and death were understood as nothingness, they would disappear. As vapor melts before the sun, so evil would have vanished before the reality of good. <coughs> One must hide the other. How important, then, to choose good as a reality. Man is tributary to God, spirit, and to nothing else. God's being is infinity, freedom, harmony, and boundless bliss. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Like the archpriest of yore, man is free to enter into the holiest, the realm of God. And so now we are going into that time of meditation and tonight I really want to focus on your awareness of how amazing you really are and how we're all just so perfect the way that we are. There's nothing that we have to do or change. We're just amazing. So take this moment to close your eyes and if you feel guided, you can put your hand over your heart to remind you of your true essence, which is love. We just let go of all the busyness of the day. nothing to do. 
designed for. to continue meditating because this song is like a meditation it is a romantic song I wrote to God it says I love you and I know it you love me and I know it estás ya lo sé que te quiero ya lo sé que en mí vives ya lo sé todo de ti ya sé que me amas ya lo sé que me cuidas ya lo sé que en ti vivo ya lo sé de 
toda duda. Está su amor. Our own Reverend Johannes Jimenez Heart Talk. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. So, why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, I don't care what my ego says about you. The Christ and the divine in me loves you just the way you are. Go ahead. We've got a lot of new faces tonight, and it's good to see you. And faces uh, that were new last week, returning. And this is, I think, our eighth week. Is that right? Indeed. Of the Miracle Hour. So, are you all enjoying yourself so far? All right. All right. My sermon and message this evening is called, Be Not afraid. And I want to use as a springboard into my message to you this evening, Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. But straightway, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Now, one Sunday morning, the pastor noticed little Johnny was staring up at the large plaque that hung in the foyer of their church. And the young man of seven had been staring at the plaque for some time, so the pastor walked up and stood behind him, and gazing at the plaque, he quietly said, Good morning, son. Good morning, pastor, replied the young man, not taking his eyes off the plaque. Sir, what is this? Johnny asked. Well, son, these are all the people who have died in the service, replied the pastor. And soberly they stood there together, staring up at the large plaque, and little Johnny's voice barely broke the silence when he asked, Which one, sir? The 9 o'clock service or the 11 o'clock service? <laughs> at any rate, my friends, tonight we're going to be talking about the idea of fear. And as we have been talking here in the last eight weeks, we all know that God has given us the emotion of love. Well, there's only two emotions, love and fear. One was given to us by God, and the other we created ourselves. And that created emotion is what we call fear. False evidence appearing real. All right? Now, all the world religions have something to say about this fear. Buddha once said that the whole secret of existence is to have no fear. Never fear what will become of you. Depend on no one. Only the moment you reject all help are you freed. Confucius said, If you look into your own heart and you find nothing wrong there, what is there to worry about? What is there to fear? And Jesus said, Be not afraid several times through the New Testament. Everyone repeat that statement with me. Be not afraid. Let's say it together. Be not afraid. Let's say it louder. Be not afraid. Now when I point to you, I want you to say that very loudly. Be not afraid. Matthew chapter 1. Mary found out that she was pregnant. And she goes and she tells Joseph that she's pregnant. Now this came as quite of a surprise to Joseph because Joseph had absolutely nothing to do with this pregnancy. And so he became very afraid. And in the midst of that fear, an angel of the Lord came to him and said, Be, let's say it together, be not afraid. In Matthew chapter 14, the disciples found themselves on a ship in the middle of a huge storm. And the New Testament said that they were trembling with fear. And they did not know what to do. And they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the ship. And Jesus said, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus was walking among the multitudes. And he said to one of his disciples, who touched me? And the disciple responded, what do you mean who touched me? You're, you're among thousands of people who are pressing in upon you. 
And he said, no, 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 no. I felt something issue from me. And he turned around and the woman said, I touched the hem of your garments. And then a ruler of a synagogue stood up and said, my daughter is dead and I don't know what to do. And Jesus said, be not afraid, only believe. And finally in John chapter 14, Judas said, to Jesus, how, Jesus, will you manifest yourself to us? And Jesus responded by saying, my peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. Let not your heart be troubled. Be not afraid. Now, could these wise men be more clear? <laughs> that fear is a condition to you and I that is unnatural. It is unnatural. Again, fear is an acronym. F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. As I said previously, there are only two emotions. One was given to us by God through his creation. And the other, fear, we call the ego, edging God out. Or as Michael Pritchard once said, fear is that little dark room in the mind where negatives are developed. Amen? Amen. Now, when we are not aware of fear, it does not mean that we have no fear. It just means that we may not be aware of it. In fact, one might say that a major goal of this spiritual journey that you and I are on is to help us to become aware of our fears so that they may be healed. So next time you're afraid, I invite you to look at those fears that you're having as an opportunity for you to bring them up within your conscious mind to be healed. Now, you say, Kevin, where did this fear come, when, come from? Now, I want you to stick with me here a little bit so you can wrap your mind around this. Fear is a product of guilt. Now, we talked about guilt last week extensively, and I'm not going to talk that much about it today because I really want to delve into fear a little bit more. So you and I understand that this is an instrument of separation, an instrument of destruction within our lives. And I want to share with you tonight not only what fear is, but how to undo fear within your experience. So, we teach and believe and receive of God that we live and move and have our being in God by living in the present moment, right? Yes. By living in the now moment. And the reason why it's so important for us to live and move with other people in the now moment as opposed to the corridors of time and space and the past and the future is because in this present moment is the only place where you and I can experience each other's divinity without the taint of time, without the taint of the past, without the taint of the future coming over and clouding over the present moment. It's the only place that you and I can be mentally where we experience and realize our holiness. Now, everyone say that with me. Holiness. holiness. Let's say it again. Holiness. Now, I invite you not to just say that word tonight, but I invite you to actually allow yourself to feel and experience and realize it this evening. Because you are holy, and I am holy, because God is holy. And we are a creation of God. Now I bring all of that up for one reason. That the ego's game and dynamic within this world is the exact opposite of living in the now moment and experiencing the divinity that God created us with and created our brothers and sisters with. What instead most people unfortunately carry around with them in their lives is guilt. Guilt. You say, Kevin, why do we feel guilty? Well, on an unconscious level, we believe because we feel we're separate from God and separate from others, and by the way, we're not, but we feel that we are. And from that feeling of separation from God and separation from other people, we have this humongous collective guilt that we're experiencing. Now keep in mind as we go through here, guilt is a collective experience, fear is individualized and personalized, okay? You all with me? Say amen. Amen. All right. So guilt is what most people carry around in their present moment experience. Now, guilt past tense is always perceived as sin. Sin is an acronym for self-induced nonsense. 
Now, you and I both know that sin is as illusory as time and space is. And we mystics and metaphysics live and move beyond the veil of sin, beyond the veil of time and space to reach the eternal nature within our brothers and sisters and within ourselves. But again, the ego is not playing that game. It's playing the opposite game. So in the present moment, it carries around with a guilt. In past tense, it calls that guilt sin. Future tense, it calls that guilt fear. All right? Now listen, my friends, if you live totally in the present moment, then you would have no fear, right? Because all fear is a fear of what's going to happen to me tomorrow. And may I submit to you that what you fear, you will find. What you fear, you will find. It is a fact, though, that 84% of what we are afraid of never comes true. 14% of our fears we have control over and can change the outcome. Only 4% of our fearful future is in our control. And yet most of these things never become reality either. <coughs> Do you know that fear... Remember that statement from A Course in Miracles, take not one step into the descent toward hell because having taken one step, you will not recognize the others when they follow. And they will follow. And the same is true for fear. Fear will take you farther than you ever thought you'd go. And it will keep you in hell longer than you'd ever <coughs> thought you'd stay. The good news though tonight is that fear never ever turns out as bad as fear paints it. Unfortunately, because our thoughts and mind produce after their kind and the world is nothing but an outward picture of an inward condition, what you fear within your mind and what you hold in your mind will always, you will find. What you fear, you will find. You remember Job in the Old Testament? He said, oh my God, all that I have feared has come upon me. That which I have feared the most has come upon me. Well, duh. <laughs> what you fear, you will find. You say, Kevin, why do we fear? Well, that's a good question. The Course tells us that into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea in which the Son of God, that's you and that's me, remembered not to laugh. Not to laugh at what? At the tiny insane idea that we could be separate from God, our source, and separate from our brothers and sisters. And so in that tiny tick of time, you and I took a detour into fear because of our belief, deep held belief in the separation. The other thing that we need to become aware of this evening is that we fear things in direct proportion to our ignorance of it. All right? Most people, for instance, fear God. All right? And they fear God because in direct proportion to their ignorance of what God is. They believe God is this entity up in the sky, ready to strap them up, feed them something that tastes like castor oil. And so they become afraid. Why? Not because they're stupid, but because they're ignorant of the fact that God is in our midst right here and right now. You fear in direct proportion of your ignorance of something. This week, I'll give you an example. I normally prepare for my message on Tuesday evenings on Sundays and Mondays. So Sunday morning, I wake up and I go into the kitchen and I see this puddle of water in the kitchen. But I don't see where that water is coming from at all. And I wake up there and I was like, where is this water coming from? So we got all of that water up and we searched the entire kitchen to see where this was coming from. Finally, we found a stream of water coming out of a corner of a wall of all places. And I thought to myself, dear God, I'm going to have to call somebody in on my days that I prepare for my message you know, in silence and listening and receptivity. And I'm going to have to have construction workers here, not only on a Sunday, but a Monday and probably on a Tuesday. 
because they're going to have to tear down that wall. And do you know, I, in that moment, became afraid. I became afraid. Why? I was afraid direct, in direct proportion to my ignorance of what was going on. And I merely had to be reminded of one thing. That the Course says, if you knew who walks beside you on the way that you have chosen, fear would be impossible. You would be incapable of being afraid if you knew that God was here in our presence. And that God, despite construction, which by the way did go on Sunday, Monday, and today, banging, drilling, and here I'm trying to hear the voice for God. Right? But I was afraid that I would not be in a receptive state to receive that message. But you know what? All I had to do was change my mind and recognize and repeat to myself, there is nothing to fear. God is still love. But if my sermon is crap this evening, you're going to bl blame the construction workers, right? We sometimes use fear as a defense. Listen to this. Defense is frightening. It stems from fear. Increasing fear as each defense is made. You think it offers safety, yet it speaks of fear made real and terror justified. Is it not strange that you do not pause to ask, as you elaborate your plans and make your armor thicker and your locks more tight, what you defend and how and against what. My favorite lesson in A Course in Miracles is, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. Say that with me. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. My friends, anytime you and I defend anything, it's an indication, number one, that you are afraid. And number two, it is an indication that what you are defending is weak. All right? If you did not believe that what you were defending was weak, why would you defend it? The very fact that you become defensive about anything is an indication that you believe on some level within your experience that what you are defending needs defense because it is a weak idea. So what do we most become defensive about? Two things. We become defensive about our bodies and we become defensive about our egos. Our egos are, quote, so vulnerable and open to attack that just a word a little whisper that you do not like, a circumstance that suits you not, or an event that you did not anticipate upsets your world and hurls it into chaos. Sound familiar? I'm sorry, but my friends, I do not want to live in a world where I can sit in front of a television and hear somebody say something outrageous and it throws my world into chaos. I don't want to live that kind of a world where something external to me upsets me. I have to remind myself, I only upset myself. So what do we believe our defenses gives us? We believe inherently that our defenses gives us a sense of safety, a sense of protection from the external world. And so if we raise our defenses, that's what the ego says that we will receive, that we will receive safety, we will receive protection. But what do defenses really give us? Defenses really give us vulnerability, weakness, fear, and identification with a lowly false self that needs constant defense. Constant defense. So the next time you become defensive, I invite you to really look at that and ask yourself, what am I afraid of in this moment? Who am I afraid of? For as the Course says, no one who walks this world in armature, but must have terror striking at his heart. You know, by the way, these defenses don't work, do they? Do you remember during the, uh, af right after 9-11, and the United States of America put up this system of levels of threat? Now, let me ask you, did that make anyone here feel any safer? No. No. Because again, when we defend anything, what we are defending, we must be acknowledging, is inherently weak. 
When you feel the need to arise, to be defensive about anything, you have identified yourself with an illusion, and you're kidding yourself. And so we want to identify instead with a self that is real. This is why at the beginning of every service I say we are as God created us to be and not what we made of ourselves. We're not this self-concept or ego that we get up every day and make up. We're not that. And being defensive is part of keeping that self-image that we create each and every day intact. Remember this. Every decision that you make today and every day stems from what you believe yourself to be and places an evaluation upon yourself. Become defensive, become fearful, and you say that you are an ego trapped inside of a body. Drop your defenses, begin to learn how to undo your fear, and you are saying essentially to yourself that I am a perfect and whole child of God as he created me to be. I am a child of the light. I am a child of the day. It is not danger that comes when defenses are laid down. It is safety. It is peace. It is joy. And it is God. You remember the very beginning of A Course in Miracles? And by the way, for those of you unfamiliar with A Course in Miracles, we have them available in the back. It's a psychological approach to, to the spiritual path. It's very Eastern in its philosophy, very Western in its terminology. But at the very beginning of the course, it says this course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. And herein lies the peace of God. Nothing real, the love and the light of God, can be threatened and therefore does not need a defense. And nothing unreal, fear, exists. And my friends, if you understand this knowledge, then you have the key to eternal peace, not after you die, but right now and for all eternity. Joseph Campbell says that the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. The question on the table tonight is, what cave are you afraid of entering within your life? Next, who and what do we fear? Well, First of all, we're afraid of this present moment, aren't we? You say, Kevin, I'm not afraid of the present moment. Really? Then why does your mind keep jettisoning you into the future and into the past? You remember that saying, we crucify ourselves between two thieves, past regrets and future expectations. This is how we nail ourselves to the cross of time and space because we do not like living in the present moment because we are inherently afraid of the now. Now I want to know who here thinks that they're living in the now moment? Raise your hand. Okay, we got one person, two people. Now let me explain a little bit about what that means. What does it mean to live and be and see the now? No Dave, you're not in the now moment. Anyway, he's back there going, I'm in the now moment. <laughs> what does it mean to live and be and see in the present moment? Well, keep in mind that you're never really seeing the now, now. You're not seeing the now in materiality. You're not seeing the now in physicality. Why? Because everything that your eyes set upon right, quote unquote, now is already over and done with. It's in the past. You say, Kevin, I don't understand it. Well, let me explain. When that light hits me, okay, and hits my retina, it takes a bit to travel to my eyesight and then bounces back off of you and then bounces back to me before I register it. And so by the time I see you, Sean, you're already over and done with. It's in the past. Does everyone see that? Say yes. Okay. So it's in the past. And we want to learn and experience how to be in the now. How do we be in the now? We live and be in the now by learning to shut our eyes to see. <laughs> by learning to exercise the spiritual eye, or as some refer to it as the third eye. 
To be able, as Jesus said, if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. To be able to look beyond duality and see the unchanging, unchanged, and unchangeable nature of the divine within my brother and sister and within myself. But we don't do that. We don't live and move here. We don't allow the peace and presence of God to fill us up because we are not living in the now moment. What else are we afraid of? Well, we're afraid of who we are. And so we get up and reinvent ourselves every morning with another self-concept. This is what I'm going to be today. Because I am afraid to acknowledge that I am light. I am afraid to acknowledge that I am love. The Course says, teach only love, for that is what you are. You know, we're afraid of other people too, aren't we? Have you ever been in an experience where somebody says to you, I love you, and you automatically think, hmm, how much is this relationship going to cost me? How much is it going to cost me financially? How much is it going to cost me emotionally? How much is, is it going to cost me in terms of time, my friends? These are not matters or issues of love. These are postures and premises that are born out of fear. Out of fear. And we wonder why our relationships are so unhealthy. Why a relationship isn't full of love, but it's rather two sets of expectations who come together to live in frustration and slap a label of love on it. I'm here to declare to you that that is not love. That that is fear. Because love does not demand a sacrifice. You say, okay, Kevin, I got it. I understand. I understand where fear came from. I understand how debilitating it is to my life. I understand I want to let it go. But how do I do that? How do I let my fears go? Well, I'm reminded of the statement that enlightenment, and this is by Carl, Dr. Carl Jung, that enlightenment is not about imagining figures of light, but rather it is about making the darkness conscious. Making the darkness conscious. I have an exercise I do with people in counseling. Because a lot of the issues that you and I experience on a day-to-day -day basis comes from the programming and the conditioning that ha occurred with us when we grow up. All right? A lot of the guilt that we carry around with us on a daily basis comes from how we were conditioned, right? So I give an exercise to those I'm counseling. And I say this, I want you to go home and for the next 30 days, I want you to write down 30 times a day, mom, if you're a man, start with your mother, if you're a woman, start with your father, mom, I love you and I forgive you, or dad, I love you and I forgive you. Now. Something strange occurs when they do this. What happens is they first have difficulty writing that. All right? So their, their penmanship is kind of off. That's the first thing that happens. Because uh, what, what's happening is the subconscious mind is coming up. The darkness is coming up. And they begin to become angry. All right? So this is why I have them write it 30 times a day for 30 days. And after you're done with your dad, go to your mom. After you're done with your mom, go to your dad. And what they find is that things that they thought had no relation whatsoever to their mom and dad began to slip away in their lives. Sicknesses began to disappear. Bad habits began to break away. Why? Because they were carrying all of this guilt around with them. And they needed to forgive it and let it go and move on in their lives. And I invite you, if you're having difficulty in your relationships... If you're having difficulty with family members, I don't care if your relationship with your dad and your mom are great. I don't care. That's not what this is about. What this is about is you and I 
allowing the darkness that we have suppressed in our unconscious mind to come up so that we may look at it and deal with fear straight in the face. And let me share something else with you. Because a lot of people, when they become afraid, they try to change their behavior. All right? All right? This never, ever works. Why? Because behavior is a product of your mind and your thinking. So when an error occurs within your experience, you need to go to where the error occurred for it to be correct corrected. You have to go to the mind to correct it. Listen to this. You may believe that you are responsible for what you do, but not for what you think. The truth is that you are responsible for what you think because it is only at this level that you can exercise choice. What you do comes from what you think. And you cannot separate yourself from the truth by giving autonomy to behavior. Tommy, can you join me with some music, please? We are reminded in the course that the primary responsibility of the miracle worker, that's you and that's me. And the miracle is nothing but a shift in perception from a fearful way of looking at something to a loving way. That the primary responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept this teaching for myself. It is not to try to impose it upon Jason or upon John or Jack or Johannes, but to accept this teaching for myself. I'm not here to change any of you. I'm not. I'm not up here speaking for you. I'm up here speaking for Kevin Rice. And I invite you as well to take upon that mantle, that motto, that I am responsible. It is my responsibility to accept the atonement for myself. That means it's my responsibility when a fear comes up that I look at that fear and I deal with it. How do I deal with it now? Mostly. Mostly I deal with it with an affirmation and a, or rather a denial and an affirmation. There is nothing to fear. God is only love. Say that with me. There is nothing to fear. God is only love. So you begin to talk yourself out of the insanity. You begin to trace the children back to the mother. You begin to have a dialogue with yourself so that you can look at these fears as they come up because they are coming up to be healed. Because whenever you are afraid, it is a sure sign that you have allowed your mind to miscreate and not allowed God to guide it. That you would rather sit there and stew in that fear and allow that fear to manifest itself in your external world as opposed to letting it go, changing your mind and saying, Spirit of love, help me to see this through your vision. Help me to see this through your sight. And we need to remember as well that you give fear power the moment that you believe it needs to be mastered. It does not need to be mastered, just as the ego doesn't need to be mastered. It needs to be recognized for the illusory nature that it represents. Krishnamurti, how many are familiar with Krishnamurti? I love him. He said a long time ago that the seeing is the doing. And I, for years, had no idea what that meant. The seeing is the doing. Until I began to work with those times and those moments when fear came up into my experience. And normally what would happen is I would react. But then I learned to take a witness kind of approach, where you kind of step back and you look kind of objectively at the experience that you're going through. And you learn instead of going to somebody else for help to get rid of the fear or going to a psychologist or a counselor or to a minister, that you admit the truth about yourself. If we tell ourselves the truth about how lazy, how dull, how addicted, how judgmental, how fearful or whatever else we are, then we are seeing truly. We are not kidding ourselves. We're letting the rubber meet the road. And we're beginning to look at ourselves and say, hey, look, look at how judgmental Kevin Rice is being. But do it from a place where you are removed from the experience so that you don't immediately react. 
but that you step back in a non-judgmental kind of way and say, okay, this is what Kevin Rice looks like. This is what Jason Weeks looks like. Does everyone get that? Say yes. It's called witnessing. And finally this evening, I really, really want you to begin to take more risks in your life. Charles, or excuse me, Robert Schuller once said that the people who are really failures are the people who set their standards so low, keep the bar at such a safe level that they never run the risk of failure. You know, a real life example of this principle occurred when one time a chemist named Paul, Paul Ehrlich discovered a drug to treat those afflicted with syphilis. It was named Formula 606. Do you know why it was named Formula 606? Because the first 605 tests were a failure. My friends, I need to share something with you. I've experienced moving through this in terms of helping people. You all met uh, Aaron last week, right? And Aaron and I, about eight years ago, I remember we were sitting on our balcony and all Aaron had, and I told him I was going to share this tonight, all Aaron had was a GED. Now he worked at like Macy's or Dillard's or somewhere in management, but he hated it. He just hated it. And so we sat on the balcony one evening and I said, Aaron, what is your passion? Well, what is your passion? He says, I don't know. I said, well, you watch the Weather Channel 24 hours a day. Perhaps the weather might be your passion. I said, could it be that you're being guided to go to school and leave your job? A huge risk. But my friends, that happened eight years ago. And he is a year away from his doctorate at the University of Miami. He took a risk. He moved beyond his fear. And he's happy. He's fulfilled. He couldn't be here tonight because he's working on his dissertation. I, Jason, Dave Garces, Tommy, Reverend Johannes, all of us took a huge risk with the miracle hour. A risk that a lot of people would not take. Why? Because we are not going to allow fear to guide us. We are not going to allow our fear of failure to stop us. We are not going to allow our fear of other people's opinions to stop us. But we are going to undo that fear and allow love to be our guide. Amen? That's the way we move forward. That's the way we live life. No fear. Everyone say with me, no fear. No fear. No fear. Thank you, Miracle Hour. I love you. Thank you, Kevin. Can you just stand up so that we can recognize you and appreciate you? This guy's amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Wow. Now I'd like to uh, invite up the ushers. And as they're coming forth, I want you to take this moment to to prove spiritual law, to prove that what you put into circulation really comes back to you. And this, this operation here is only possible through your donations, your tithing. And I really want you to take this moment and think about the music, the meditation, the amazing message that you receive here and what you take with you out into the world so that you can live a life of no fear. Think about that.
tongue will confess you are God. One heaven to me will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, this is the time to you are to worship come just as you are before your God come one day every tongue will confess you are God one day every knee will bow still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One every day I'll confess you are God. One day every day will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to Now is the time to give your heart. Come, come, come. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Johannes. And now that our ushers are back in front of us, let's take this moment to be grateful for the offerings. And from A Course in Miracles, we are reminded that gratitude goes hand in hand with love. And where one is, the other must be found. For gratitude is but an aspect of the love which is the source of all creation. God gives thanks to you his son, for being what you are, his own creation and the source of love along with him. In the offerings before us, we see nothing but love and gratitude, and we thank God. Amen. And next week, we are going to have guest singer Samantha Garcia, so please come and check that out. And also, we have the table in the back, and I want you to go back there for three reasons tonight. One is for Johanny's CD, that we have on sale back there. The second is for all the books, and also you get to see David's haircut, cut off all his hair. Um, like Kevin said, Aaron can't be with us tonight. And finally, the food and fellowship in the back. So come check out what we got. I think we have chicken wings back there tonight, as always. Yeah, fried chicken. Woohoo. And um, also there's Harvey's in the Bay in the middle of the, uh, of the building. So go check that out. Amazing view of the Bay. Um, but definitely come back, chat a little bit, have some food. And most importantly, thank you for being here tonight. We really appreciate your support. And go throughout this week with no fear. No fear. I can march on in freedom. I can march on in peace. I can live every day in victory. Cause I am not afraid. Can you say I?
Good night.